Hey guys, it's Sebastian here from Noble Frugal Studio, and today's video is all about backgrounds. Over the past four or so years that I've spent creating backgrounds for my short film Castle Dark, I have developed my own unique workflow when it comes to making them. So the point of this video is to share that workflow with you and also share some of the tips and tricks that I've learned over the years creating backgrounds for animation. Disclaimer, I am not a professional nor am I completely and utterly satisfied with my work. I'm still learning and improving with each drawing that I make. I made this video so that those of you who struggle drawing backgrounds can watch closely during the parts of my demonstration where I'm doing the specific thing that you struggle with. That way you can see how I go about doing it and add some tips, tricks, and pointers to your own workflow. Before I get into the tutorial slash demonstration, I want to say a warm welcome to you new viewers or you recently subscribed ones. My name is Sebastian. I'm an animator providing animation tutorials, demonstrations, speed paints, you name it, here on YouTube while I work on my animated short film Castle Dark. If you're new to animation, in general, make sure to get subscribed because I have a great video coming up which will explain all you need to know to start animating digitally with a free program called OpenTunes. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's jump right in with the very first thing to do before you make a background, and that is initiate the brainstorm phase. This is where you get all your ideas, do a few thumbnail sketches to get an idea for the background. So the very first thing to do before I make any background is acquiring reference. To put it simply, before you start drawing, you want to gather together some images that are associated with the scene you're trying to draw. This will help you to expand your imagination and to come up with artwork that looks believable and genuine. For example, in my case, I'm illustrating a medieval ballroom. So I ran a quick Google search and found some pictures of ballrooms in large mansions and castles so I can get an idea of what I'm trying to portray. I chose a select few images that appeal to me and dropped them in a folder on my desktop. This way, if I'm ever stuck thinking about what to add in my scene, I can refer to those images. No matter what you're drawing, getting reference is essential to your piece looking believable. For instance, let me ask you, does this painting look like a ballroom? You might be thinking, well, yeah, I guess. Because after seeing those reference images earlier, this painting doesn't necessarily scream ballroom at you. When I made this reference painting years ago, I did minimal research and didn't really explore different ideas. I could have definitely done some more research and captured the essence of a ballroom. So when I ask you whether or not it looks like one, it would be a resounding yes. Lack of reference in any sort of artwork is what usually lends to the artist being disappointed with their work or the work itself looking a bit off. Anyway, for the sake of consistency within my film, I'm going to keep this new painting similar to the original painting I made years back so that when anyone watches my film, they'll see the two paintings as the same room. So kind of a bummer. With that said, my message to you viewers regarding this phase of the background drawing process is to definitely explore multiple ideas and think about the tone of the scene you're trying to make before jumping into the drawing phase. The very next thing to do is some thumbnail sketches. Thumbnailing is where you establish roughly what the shot is going to look like. The goal of this phase is to establish the general layout for your background and to help guide you during the drawing phase. Thumbnailing can be quite the inventive experience because you don't have to worry about establishing perspective beyond a simple vanishing point in a horizon line. It's just you using the reference that you gather to come up with ideas. I highly recommend doing at least five of these and picking the one you like best to go further with. Experiment with different perspectives and camera placements and then choose the one that fits the mood of your scene best. There is a chance that since some of you are making films, that you've already established the basic shot of your scene within your storyboard. If that is the case, then I recommend that you refine the background itself in just a few thumbnail sketches so as to get the main idea of the image across. All right, now with our brainstorming and pre-production homework done, we can get to the actual production phase. That means drawing the background. The very first thing I do when actually drawing a background is thoroughly establishing the perspective of the shot. And trust me, when I say thoroughly, I mean it. Really take the time to draw out the guidelines according to your vanishing point for all the props in your scene. I usually start with the horizon line and then I draw in a vanishing point. After that, I draw the lines to indicate the size of the floor, walls, and all other objects in the scene. And as you can see, I'm drawing a cube around this table even though the table is a round shape. This just helps me to visualize how much space the table is taking up in, in a 3D arena. What you'll end up with after developing this sort of guide layer is something that looks almost like a blueprint of your drawing. And that's what you want going into your sketching phase. If you guys want a tutorial focusing entirely on perspective, just drop me a comment down below and I'll make it happen. 
All right, so now we're in Krita, and as you can see, the photo that I took is very blurry. That's because this was a panning shot, so I actually took two different screenshots and merged them together to get kind of like the full um, field of view of what I'm looking at. So basically, I take one of these screenshots and then I put it in the middle because the thing that, that I'm going to paint is going to be a lot. Um, usually, it's going to be bigger than the actual, actually what you're seeing in the movie. So the painting is going to be a little different. Name that SK1. That stands for sketch one because usually I do one sketch and then I do my SK2 will be the final line. So I lower the opacity on these. So they're, they serve as a guide. Basically what I outline when I'm in the animation software is the vanishing point um, of the shot. And I outline some perspective as you can see here. Um, just to get my get myself started and to get myself in the mindset of what is the shot going to look like. So I added some of the some minor background details, of course, the tables because they're going to be um, the secondary thing that you see besides these characters um, in the in this background. So and I've also added the door, which is very important to the story, which is why I put it in gray or like a dark sort of color so it can stand out amongst all the white. So, but we're going to be adding a lot of um, colors and stuff like that here. So we're definitely going to have to make this door stand out because it's important to the story. I like to make a guide layer above this to firmly establish the the vanishing point and the perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over right here. I'm going to do this. Right. It's called the assistant tool. Very useful. Go above to the color selection, go to tool options, and then we're going to hit vanishing point right here, right on the bottom. I'm, as you can see, this little green thing that I outlined right here, very hard to see, but that's the vanishing point for the shot. You just click and it creates it. And I'm going to drag the density all the way up so we don't get any of the lines. Maybe I just want a few for now, like something like that, just to give myself an idea of what I'm doing here. I can change the color. I'm probably going to be using red for the perspective lines. So I'm going to make it like a tealish blue. Um, so it can contrast a little bit. There we go. And it's not too obtrusive. So we're not looking at it all the time, which is nice. And actually, I am going to get rid of all these lines because when you use a line tool and such, it will help you by giving you a guide like that. So I don't really need to have all the lines around. Um, I'm going to go back to the to the colors. I'm going to select red on our guide layer, and I'm just going to point out everything that is going to be useful. Now, on my other monitor, I have the other shots of this painting. I'm going to put them on the screen for you guys right here. Um, it's just two shots that I have that are of the same room, and I'm going to use those as my reference to what exactly I'm painting, what are the props in the background looking like. Um, so the first thing I'm probably going to outline is this table is pretty important, so I'm going to start with that. What I learned about this par parallel tool is actually if you make a parallel line, right? So we're going to go back to the parallel ruler, and I'm just going to make one that's straight like this, no deviations, just like that. And then we go back to our brush tool. Now we have um, a vertical guide for all of our um, lines, which is really awesome. And since we already made the horizontal version, we have a horizontal guide. So this is actually really good for you guys doing one point perspective. Um, I didn't know that you could do this, but apparently you can. Um, this is part of the reason I love using Krita. It's um, very helpful for perspective and why well, it's just it's just a great software. And it's good that we have a character model here because now we know the sizes of our characters. I'm going to put that in the guide, definitely. Just make a guide for how big your characters are. Very, very important. I've had this problem where the doors were too big. Um, it didn't make sense for something to be where it was because no one will be able to reach it. And some things were reachable, some things weren't. You just got to make sure to always have this size model here to tell you just how tall is the uh, is are the characters in this scene. That definitely helps with making things such as windows, lamps, and doors, because then you know exactly where the knob should be and how tall the door should be and all that jazz. Moving on, the sketching phase is where you establish the form of every prop in your scene. Although it doesn't have to be perfect, it should have relatively defined lines so that the line art process can go smoothly. This is especially important if you're working on a team because you don't want your cleanup artist having a difficult time deciphering which line to pick from a messy sketch. Your final sketch should be relatively neat and ready for the line art phase. And I say final because you can actually do as many sketches as you want. If you'd like to do a more loose sketch to establish large prop ideas and refine it on another layer, then by all means, go for it. That's basically what I do on my guide layer, which is also the layer that I use to establish the perspective of the scene. For this shot, I'm going to separate the foreground, midground, and background into different layer groups. 
This will change a bit later, but the idea is that I'll be able to edit each layer group separate so that I can control the depth of field of my painting. Okay, for the line art phase, it's pretty self-explanatory. Just refine the lines that you drew on your sketch layer. The only thing you may have to pay attention to is the actual size of the lines you're drawing. Not all art styles use outlines, but for those that do, this is definitely something that you want to put some thought into. In my case, I'm just making my lines thinner as the objects get farther away. To do this, I made three different groups for the foreground, midground, and background as I mentioned before, and made line art layers in each group. This isn't the best way to organize this as you'll see me changing it up a bit later on, but just know that I'm trying to separate the three areas in order to add special effects later on. Now onto the coloring phase. I highly recommend that before you start drawing that you have at least an idea of what colors you're going to use in your background. The reason for this is that you don't want your background image to conflict with your scene's mood or tone. For example, in this scene, the main character of my film, Pi, is looking in on a dinner and dancing party. The tone of this scene is supposed to be sophisticated and jubilant. So what would happen if I chose very dark and gloomy colors and made the background look eerie and ominous? Well, it sure would distract you from the jubilant dinner party that was outlined in my storyboard. I would give you some tips on color theory and color choice, but as you can probably see, the colors being used here aren't exactly amazing. That's because the colors for this room were chosen about three years ago when I made this the first painting in this barroom series. It's kind of a bummer because since then I've learned so much about color theory and how to craft an appealing color palette. But for the sake of consistency, I gotta use the same colors. As a final note for the coloring phase, I used a rough guide on the guide layer to determine what objects will be placed in the foreground, midground, and background. This way, only certain props of the scene will be affected by the effects I choose to put on them. Okay, before I move on to the shading portion of this video, I want to talk about some of the tools and techniques that I've been using to draw some of the stuff in my background so that you guys can get the most out of this video. First, I'm going to go over to my favorites. These are just the brushes that I like to use. For my sketching, I like to use this paintbrush that has an opacity um, increase as you press harder. This is what I use for most of my sketching. I like this brush because it's very loose, responsive, very simple, nothing really complicated about it. I can just focus on me in the sketch. Next up, we have my the brush I use for my line art for Castle Dark specifically. It's this kind of charcoal brush. Um, I want Castle Dark to have that sort of textured look, so I would probably outline this cube with this charcoal pencil brush. Next up is the brush I use to color now. It's just a brush that doesn't have an opacity change, but it does have a size change, so I can put it on a relatively big size and still, like, you know, press lightly to get some small edges and stuff like that. Color things in pretty easily, and like we see now, pretty lazily. Now, for shading, what I like to do is I'll use this air airbrush sort of tool. If I want to get this corner, say, I'll just use the one tool, select it, and then I'll select the brush tool again. Get this bottom corner all shaded up real nice, do a nice fade on there. I need some extra fade. I'll go to this Q-tip looking tool, get some extra fade in there, and there we go. Otherwise, for shadows of direct light, I usually just go maybe down here. The I go this way, that's sort of counterclockwise on the color wheel, and then I just shade like this. Something like, um, I can even use the wand tool on this as well. That'll work out fine. We get this other area too. Grab the brush tool. Just indicate where I want the shading to be. I can do that. Or I can grab the airbrush tool, go a, a color, go to the clockwise on the color wheel, and then indicate where I want the lighting to be. One thing that I forgot to mention is how I add texture. Now, I don't go over it too much in this video. However, it's very, very simple to do in Krita. I'm gonna select this area that I want to add texture to in this cube. Also, I selected the whole cube, that's pretty good. And then I'm gonna just go on a layer above that, in the same layer I did the shading on, but that's okay, because we're not really drawing anything serious. And I'm gonna use this sort of marble-ish texture. I'm gonna select a dark blue color and go to my brush. And all I gotta do is just kind of tap, dab the pen on it, dab it harder in some areas, and then, you know, other times, maybe I'll do it in the middle, and then I'll go even lighter and do that same thing, so I can get kind of like an even spread. All right, so that's pretty much it for the tools that I use and the techniques that I use while sketching 
and painting in Krita um, for shadows, sketching and coloring. I just want to show you guys that. So if you guys are planning to use Krita as sort of like a follow along for this video that you're not completely and utterly lost when it comes to like, you know, tools and stuff like that. All right, back to the video. Now, when it comes to adding shading to your background, it's essentially you identify where the light of your scene is coming from. To the right of this drawing, there's a balcony, which you can see through the open doorways. This is the primary source of light in my scene, since all the sunlight is being let in through those doorways and windows. Now, all we have to do is determine where each object is getting hit by the light based on its position. Again, I could make a whole video about how light behaves, and if you would like to see that, then feel free to leave a comment below. But basically, I'm going to put a shadow anywhere that the light doesn't hit. For instance, the light is hitting the front of this chair pretty intensely, but due to the relatively thick cloth that I imagine these chairs are made of, all of that light is being reflected back towards the doors and is unable to hit the back of the chair due to the chair's position. That's a very basic explanation of what's going on. Again, I can do a whole other tutorial about light if you would like. Wow, it almost seemed like we were talking about lighting when we were actually talking about shading because they're sort of the same thing when it comes to like the phases. I just put them on different layers and that's because I add different effects to them. The lighting in this painting is pretty much the opposite of the shading. Anywhere I see that would be strongly affected by the light rays coming from the balcony, then I'll add a lighter version of the current color on top in a lighting layer. There is a lot to learn when it comes to the colors you should choose when adding lighting and shading to your drawing. Again, another tutorial. Leave a comment if you want it. Okay, so the painting is mostly done except for some minor color adjustments and some extra lighting. So what I'm going to show you guys first is how to is how to add like an ambient shadow and, and an ambient light. So what I did is, as you can see in this ambient shading layer, I'm going to show it. So when I turn this layer on, click, and then you can see that I added some shadows in the corners between the wall and the ceiling and also right here um, at the edge of the wall. And please ignore these little dots right here. I'm going to fix those in a second. <laughs> but the way I do this is that I grab the wand tool like I showed you before, select sort of like a wall. Then I grab the gradient tool, select a color that's a little deeper than pink. And then, I mean, sorry, not deeper, darker than pink. And then I just apply the gradient in a certain direction like that. And then I control shift A to deselect that area. So we have this ambient shading on a normal layer right now. So it looks kind of like this, as you can see in the preview right here, but we want to change the layer type so we can get a different effect out of our shading. Let's go to normal and hit multiply. Now it's a little darker. We can decrease the opacity to adjust it to where we want it. I'm going to put it about there. Next up, we have our ambient lighting layer. Preview that. As you can see in the preview, it's simply just a gradient of a sort of grayish blue to a, a dark desaturated brownish red. And the reason it's shining so brightly right now is because we set it to be a color dodge layer. If we put it on normal, it just looks like gray. And this is what it really looks like. But let's hit normal, go down to color dodge. And now it looks at this really bright and vibrant scene. This is the benefit of using layer blending modes. You can get these really cool effects. And since my main sources of light are right on this um, right side, then it's very easy for me just to make a gradient and make this side look very bright and vibrant. But I'm going to turn that down just so it's not overpowering to somewhere around there. So this is what it's, no it's like normally and just increase it to where we would like it. Great thing about color dodge is that it doesn't distort any detail, it just simply adds brightness. So with that guys, that's pretty much how I make my backgrounds. I hope this process helped you. I know it really helped me solidify how I make my backgrounds, what my actual process is and my thought process, because teaching actually helps you learn a lot as well. Thank you guys for watching so much. If you want to support my work and my channel and my, the film that I'm making, make sure to go into the description below and click on that Patreon link. You can get access to the Patreon feed, which is the latest updates about my film, 4K wallpapers, exclusive tutorials, merch discounts, and much, much more coming in the future. You can get in as low as $1. Speaking of merch, the brand new Noble merch has just dropped on my Teespring Pies treasury. Go over there, pick your color, pick your size, and most important of all, look dope. That's all from me, guys. Thanks for watching again, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace. Special thanks to ONR on Patreon for supporting this channel. If you're interested in animation or you're a beginner, someone who's new to the art of animation, get subscribed because you will not want to miss the video I got coming up for you guys who are new to the art. If this video helped you out, share it with your friends, get subscribed. I'm out. Peace.